that, and for me is so important is that it encapsulates those feelings of taking action and feeling like hopeful through the power of a transformative community. Because I, I don't think at this point that, you know, any young person really watching what's coming out of COP26 is actually believing that those people are taking action on the climate crisis at the scale and the speed that we need them to. And so the film is actually offering an alternative to that in the form of grassroots organizing and and capturing the feelings and and what it means to to take collective action and actually in the process i think has the potential to convince a lot of young people who are right now really not hopeful about the future that there is an alternative and that they can be like like implicated in that alternative but that it's also not specifically on them as an individual to fix the problem that it's a it's a collective thing that we can we can have control over and we can shift power, but it's not a, like an, indiv- an individual responsibility. And it's also not something that's going to be fixed by our leaders. So are you saying that direct action has has more probability than changing policy? I think that would be maybe a false binary, just in terms of I do think that, um, yeah, we, we have an incomplete understanding of cha- how change happens at this point. I think we really look to things like social media and things like plastic cups and straws, for example, in terms of the climate crisis as the main means of making change. And so I do think that policy can often fall under that umbrella in that it can be like pretty watered down, like we saw with the federal bill C-12 this year, um, or like very centered in in action, as we see like in the film itself within a meeting with Minister Heyman. But I do think that in understanding collective action and understanding how that has the power to popularize and institutionalize solutions to the climate crisis, it can be working in tandem with public policy to be pushing us towards climate action that is actually meeting the crisis at the scale and the speed that we need it to. <laughs> I think you're amazing. Yeah, we all think she's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Talk about Sustainability Teens. Who are they? Yeah, Sustainability Teens was and is a collective of young people who are based in Metro Vancouver, so Vancouver and some of the surrounding cities who are who were originally organizing around the climate strikes that were popularized by Greta Thunberg um, in Sweden. And then since then have been united both around like a desire for agency for young people in the city and then also um, around the climate crisis and its urgency and the need for solutions to that crisis. Are you still working with them? No. So Sustainability Teens is mostly a high school based organization. And so a lot of those of us who are in the film uh, have since graduated high school. Um, and so we've we've continued to play sort of supporting roles with the high school collective. And then um, more recently, like a few of us have moved away and so have been in touch, but aren't the main sustainability teens any longer. So what's next for you? Yeah, I'm currently based in Hamilton in Ontario. I'm going to university at McMaster. Um, so I'm doing that. And then actually, Rebecca and I are both sort of involved in a group of young people across the country who are reflecting on where the youth climate justice movement has been so far. So both with the climate strikes, like in, in the film, but also just in terms of like other environmental organizations, other work that's been done. And we're thinking really intentionally about designing the next steps for the climate movement. So basically we've realized that at this point and the climate strikes contributed a lot to this, um, but people are aware that climate change is a problem and, and are aware that, you know, action is needed, but they aren't able to name any sort of viable climate solutions. Like most Canadians just don't feel that connection between like a problem and the solution. And so the real gap in the ecosystem in the, like the movement ecology right now is groups that are popularizing climate solutions that aren't false, that aren't just about carbon capture and storage, which is predicated on like the idea that emissions will continue. Or, or false solutions like plastic straws, but are instead actually grounded in justice and equity and will improve people's material lives. And so the role of a, a movement going forward, or at least this is what the group of us think, is a group of particularly of young people, I think, who are popularizing those solutions and then also trying to figure out how to institutionalize them. So asking institutions to yeah, to, to back those solutions in order for them to be implemented. So what would you like to see happen from this documentary? How do, uh, I guess a couple questions, how do people watch What About Our Future? 
and and how do we take that viewing into uh, direct action? Yeah, maybe I can cover the second part and then Jen or Jamie, you can chime in about how to watch the film. Yeah, I think my my hope for for people who are watching the film is to really be grounded and centered in those feelings of what it means to take action. I think the film just captures so well like the, the community that we created in sustainability teams, both in its original iteration, you know, in 2019 and 2020, but also in like we're seeing it happen with younger high school students now who are like the current sustainability teams, which is just lovely to watch. Um, and so I think, yeah, people being exposed to that and being exposed to the fact that change happens when you you come together. And also you are strategic about how you take action because there aren't that many other films or books or, or like ways of being exposed to creating change. And then I think also just hoping that that people are able to plug into opportunities, whether they're, they're things that we talk about after film screenings or at some point when this group of us launches our movement, that as well, um, so that they can feel like they're, yeah, involving their like everyone is involving their whole lives in climate action rather than just seeing it as a separate thing, being able to understand that it's going to affect and is affecting all of us disproportionately, some of us more than others, but that in bringing our full selves, the movement and our whole lives, we're going to be better able to take collective action and, and create change. When we're experiencing in British Columbia some pretty horrific atmospheric rivers and rain bombs, as Al Gore calls them, and do you think that major events like these bring more awareness to local communities about the dire need to change? I do think in some respects that's the case. Um, and definitely like just the continuous experience of people in BC this fall has been pretty overwhelming. But I do think there's a danger with just continuous climate disasters, especially for young people. They jump straight from not necessarily understanding the climate crisis to like feeling despair and doom over that. I think something like 60% of young people think that humanity is just completely doomed because of climate change. And so I think the response to climate disasters, of course, has to be like about material relief and making sure that that people are recovering and adapting to the changes that are happening and also then about like mitigating future disasters, but also giving people the tools and the understanding of like their own agency and their their own ability to have some level of control like as a collective over this crisis, because otherwise we're just going to see natural disasters increase in frequency and like in magnitude and people will just start going to like the nearest alternative they see, which could be could be dangerous for other people around the world um, and definitely won't contribute to the same sense of community that we really need to see as a, a climate solution. So how do people watch this documentary? Yeah, so we were originally screening on Hollywood Suites and soon we're going to be releasing an online uh link through Vimeo. So it'll just be a really small rental fee. And so people can watch it through Vimeo. Excellent. It's a great documentary. It was really fun to watch. As I said, I've watched it a couple of times. And every time I go back and watch it, I see something else. It's a really interesting body of work. Uh, so John, I just have a question. What for you was your favorite part of the film? Just curious to know. I think for me, it's the youthful perspective. It's the kids, it's the sustainability teeners and uh, their vibrancy and their points of view that just lit me up. Kind of along the same vein, what haven't we talked about that we should be talking about? I mean, I think just to emphasize one thing in particular, I do feel like the documentary does like appeal to a certain subsection of young people and will probably or has up to this point reached a certain subject subsection of young people. And so I feel like what I appreciate most about it is that like, no matter who you are, I think there's an element of like feeling that you can identify with and you can see yourself within. But I do feel like it really comes down to what models are out there, just in terms of how we relate and relate to and understand climate change in general. Like I think all the young people who are now watching Climate Crisis Descend on British Columbia are going to be needing models of how to feel and how to act about that. And they want to be able to see themselves in those models. And so I think it's really important that as people with young people in our lives, we're really thinking about how we feel about this crisis and how we're yeah relating to this crisis because I do think a lot of that gets you know transmitted to the people that are around us and the communities that we're a part of 
And so it's particularly important to be considering the ways that we're, we're, we're treating other people and the ways that we're treating ourselves in relation to this crisis, because th that will create like the orientation towards like adaptability and resilience and the skills that are required, I think, on a bigger level to face the climate crisis. And also, I think one, one piece as well that maybe the film touches on, but that I think we're going to see more of is just the prevalence of climate grief and the idea that grief is a really important part of both processing what's happening to the earth and the people that are living on the earth, but also like is an essential part of actually like feeling the urgency of this crisis. And so I do want to see more, more people talking about that and more of like a collective effort to be grounded in those feelings because they'll bring us to a place that we need to be in order to take action. Yeah, I love that you mentioned grief because I was actually going to say the same thing. I think that that was a really important part in the film was acknowledging that beginning before getting into the actual organization work. It was a choice that we made in editing to have that scene come first of the grief because oftentimes the grief can feel so overwhelming and heavy that it can swallow you into that despair. But if you have an opportunity to really sit with the grief and allow the grief to become fuel that ends up propelling you towards wanting to do something, um, it can be a really powerful type of energy in a, in a sense to harness. And um, I saw something recently where they were saying that grief is also unexpressed love. It's almost, it's love that has nowhere to go. And so I think about that a lot of how much, when you really tune in with, you know, how much the earth is here for us and, and that it, it, it's devastating to see what's happening to the earth. And that pain, I think, really needs to be acknowledged and we need more skills and tools and support within community to really hold us through that process, I think. Um, the mental health aspect is really big right now. I really like um, what you said, Jamie, about grief being unexpressed love. There's Martine Prechtel speaks about grief and praise going hand in hand, and you can only grieve the things that you love and that you praise so deeply. And I think when you, you start can sometimes within the, um, the movements from like an industry perspective, they're looking at it as like the earth is this tool that we can extract from and that we're, um, that we need to rely on for our economic, economic gain and to keep the keep the train moving basically to keep us going. But when you look at it as this thing that you love, the earth is a place that, you know, that, that has sustained so many different species and people for longer than we can even fathom, um, then that can allow the space for the grief to be, to be felt. And I think that's an important part in the processing, like Naya said, in order to like shift it into action. So what about our future? I really want to thank you all for taking time to uh, talk about the documentary. It's important work. I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity to have you share your views and thoughts, and I hope we uh, find a way out of this mess. Yeah, thanks, Don, for giving us the space to share a little bit about the film, and yeah, I'm hopeful as well. We'll see. Okay. We can make it out of it. Yeah, fingers and toes crossed and lots of direct action. Thank you. Take care. Bye, Don. Thank Bye, you. Bye now. Bye. We've been speaking with Jamie Lee Giannopoulos and Claudio Cruz, as well as Jen Morantz and Naya when she was a sustainability teen during the filming of What About Our Future. To get involved or find out more about this project, visit whataboutourfuture.com. That's another edition of the Conversation Lab. This radio program and podcast is produced by CFRO-FM in Vancouver's downtown east side. We're on the territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil nations. Our gratitude and thanks to them, as well as to the many not-for-profit organizations, community groups, and change makers around the world that support this program. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please consider becoming a member of Co-op Radio to support this program and the many others produced by hundreds of volunteers. If you have a story to share or know someone who does, please have them contact us at coopradio.org, theconversationlab.ca, and on many social media and podcasting platforms. This episode was cobbled together with some help from Brian McKinnon, Kim Sakon, John Massacar, and Julian Anton. Thanks, guys, and thank you for listening. I'm Don Schaefer.